Okay, it's October up here in Canada, and uh, people who know me will tell you that Gilbert always gets in the mood to play American Revolution games in the autumn. I think that's because back in 1973, I visited the Saratoga battlefield at that time of year, and uh, it's an experience I never forgot. Now this game came out in 2010. It was designed by Mike Jocelyn, and it appeared in Against the Odds magazine. Now I never got around to playing it because I've been pretty busy with my own projects, and lo and behold, in 2020 came out a sequel title called Almost a Miracle, which covers the Revolutionary War in the North. It's a different designer, but uh, it uses the same core rules as um, Tarleton's Quarter. And uh, my War for America is now finished, and uh, hopefully it'll be released in the early months of 2022. Now Tarleton's Quarter has a lot of good things going for it, and uh, I'm going to show you the board and the pieces, tell you uh, some of the things I like about the game, and the odd nitpick or two. As you can see, it uses area movement and covers the region of oh, Virginia around Richmond in the Tappahannock area, down through North Carolina, South Carolina, and to the Georgia-Florida border. The large black lines represent major rivers, which are uh, a major obstacle in the south. And you've got the coastline, of course, where British forces can land by sea. Your charts are sideways, and your turn record there is sideways. Over there you've got the prisoners and continental captured box and the British captured box. Um, it, it's a weird game to orient because if you have the colonial player sit on this side, most of the charts will be sideways to him, as will be the British. But if you orient it the other way, north-south, Somebody's going to be looking at all the charts upside down, while the other player will be also looking at some of the charts upside down. So it's it's a little odd orientation, but be that as may, that uh, doesn't hurt the game, of course, at all. Now I've sorted them a particular way, but we'll take a look at them uh, closely in a moment. I've put the large value Continental and British here, the low value ones and twos Continental and British here. British leaders, Continental leaders, cavalry, that's Virginia militia, North Carolina militia, South Carolina militia, the French and um, the Georgia militia here. It's not too much in the way of Georgia militia. Uh, Tories here. These are moved counters. These are the magazines and trains, various markers you need for the game. And these are kind of siege and fort fort markers. That's the way I sorted them, but of course you're free to sort them whatever way you like. Here's some typical counters. I think they're quite nice. Well, at least one fellow on board, Game Geek, didn't like them. Thought they look kind of cartoonish. I don't mind them at all. Uh, there's your continental regulars in various denominations. Usually they're five or ten, one and two. There's some continental dragoons. There's South Carolina militia. There's a leader. They have a flip side. You flip it to show that the unit has moved. You'll see that the arrow there indicates that he's been activated. You've got your wagon trains there. Flip side of a wagon train is a magazine. And if you capture an enemy supply train, you can keep it as your own. These are some British troops. These are loyalist, a loyalist leader. Again, Clinton. And there's the British main base. Same thing as a magazine, except it's got a star on it. Taking a short tour of the map, you can see the green areas, usually along the coast, represent the swampy and low areas of the Carolinas and Georgia. And, as I mentioned, the thick, thick lines are rivers. These will play an important part, especially if the weather turns out to be uh, rain, because in rainy weather, Units can usually only cross at bridges, and uh, Continentals and uh, regular troops 
cannot move in swampy areas except by the roads. So the terrain, though kind of subtle being an area movement game, is definitely uh, there. It makes a difference. And there we're just looking up into the Carolinas there. And up into Charlotte Courthouse. Way up. That's Richmond. Richmond, Virginia, which figures so prominently in the Civil War, of course. Gloucester Point, Williamsburg, and Yorktown. It's a nice map. The um, anchors indicate uh, where British troops can land, ports, and uh, the little crowns represent uh, the capitals. Williamsburg was the colonial capital of Virginia in those days, and they're going to make a difference for uh, victory conditions. Basically, the British are trying to capture the colonial capitals and prevent any continentals from being in the colony. I should mention what the numbers mean inside the provinces. The two-digit uh, alphabetical uh, designation is just uh, to help you set up the counters. It's just a, a grid reference. But the number below it is important. That's the forage level. In other words, this area here, if the British or Americans did not have any wagon trains or within range of magazines, they'd have to forage. And the higher this forage number is, the better it is to forage. So you can see here, for example, here's one on the coast. It's only got four. But you've got some pretty handy areas here, like north of uh, Charlotte, where you could actually forage with uh, 12, much higher. Now in the game, since it's area movement, you can spread the men out, like in this example here, because I find that in some of the stacks, which are big, for example, there's some stacks that have 100 strength points on them. Now, yes, you do have large denominations of 40, so you can keep those stacks low, but sometimes the stacking gets a little high, so you can spread them out. Here, for example, is uh, Tarleton with some uh, Legion cavalry and a train. But if you prefer to have them in stacks, of course you can do so. It makes no difference for combat. Combat can potentially occur when two areas are occupied by the same by enemy, enemy forces. Here is a retreat before combat procedure. So for example, if Tarleton came upon Moultrie here and Moultrie didn't want to fight, he could roll his, what he calls his audacity level. And if he gets three or less, he is allowed to retreat. So you've got a lot of interactive rules for retreat for combat. Now the combat procedure, like many of the rules in this game, is very procedural, we'll say. Now don't do this to your um, rule book. I always work from copies, so I, I'm in a copy of the rules book here. This way I can highlight and underline, and this is the way I learn a game. But the combat procedure, there's quite a lot of things. One, the British player will have to decide whether he's going to use the bayonet charge. The next step is going to be to roll to see if you have a surprise. And if he did use a bayonet charge, there's a plus one. Then you're going to determine the winner. And that's a procedure. Okay. Uh, then there's modifiers for odds, of course. And then there's... Um, each side will roll a die, a higher player wins the battle. All kinds of modifiers here. Odds, attacker used bayonets, um, he used bayonets and failed, cavalry advantage, who won the battle, the audacity rating, whether how much militia is in it. There's a lot of little wee sub-procedures sub you have to uh, watch out for in here. And there's a chance for leader casualties, of course, too. Um, the combat system is involved and detailed, even though it's an area movement. So in trying to, um, you know, show you combat of the period, it's necessarily, there's lots of procedures in it. So you have to get used to that. And I don't mind it at all. It actually works pretty good. My little nitpick in the game is the procedures for uh, attrition. I'll show you that on the sequence of play. Now as I scroll down, you're going to see that there's a lot of procedures. Now they're grouped in general with the siege resolution phase, the attrition phase, which has lots of sub-cases, 
the reinforcement phase, the logistics and engineering phase, the endeavors phase, which most people would call an action phase, adjustment phase, and the special siege resolution phase. So all of these procedures must be done in a particular order. No surprise there, many games have that. But my little nitpick is this attrition phase. It's necessary for the simulation, I'm afraid. So I'm not knocking the game as a simulation. It's just that several times in the game you've got to go through this disease attrition, then continental militia attrition, then loyalist militia attrition sometimes, then you're going to check for supply and roll for out of supply attrition, then you're allowed to destroy your own baggage train or magazine units, and then you're going to do POW attrition. And some of those attrition moves only occur on certain turns. Now I had to I put these little wee dots here to remind me when certain attrition occurs. On the turn record itself, you've got particular turns where smallpox or yellow fever kicks in. So what's wrong with all that? Well, nothing really. It simulates the period very, very well. But it does slow the game down. I find the procedures um, a little long. And I find myself, especially when playing solitaire, you're doing a lot of these procedures. You're going to the work of putting all these men on the board through reinforcements and raising them and stuff like that. And then you do all these procedures to reduce them due to disease. It's bothersome and it's a lot of work, but like I said, that's the way it was. It's a good simulation in that sense. Now I will say that the rules are about 16 pages long and they're pretty detailed. There's an errata sheet which I recommend you get but um, for a 16 page uh, booklet this is a very detailed game. I can tell that the designer um, has done his due diligence that's for sure. He's obviously read a lot about the Southern Campaign. Uh, I've read a lot about it too. Um, I've got Simcoe's Military Journal. That's pretty interesting reading. Um, I also got Tarleton's history of the campaigns in the South. And by the way, Tarleton was not the monster as portrayed in the movie The Patriot with Mel Gibson. A movie which I like, by the way, but uh, it was not accurate as far as Tarleton was concerned. And if you want a good general work, uh, this Road to Guilford Courthouse is all about the American Revolution in the Carolinas. So there's lots of literature available out there on the campaigns in the South. To give you an idea of how detailed the game really is, just looking at the charts that are available will tell you a lot. Here you've got your Continental Militia generation. You've got random events. Of course your terrain movement effects. A description of what the counters mean. You've got Militia Attrition, which depends on the month and a die roll. You've got this table for surprise attack, your leader movement uh, rates. There's a whole section here for how to do the battle. You may remember me saying that the combat uh, procedure is quite detailed. There's the sequence of play. And um, what I did was I copied these charts and put them up on cardboard uh, and uh, made them kind of nicer and easier to use. There's a lot more I could say about the game. It's got prisoner exchange in it. Um, there's several scenarios. But I don't know. I, I quite like the game. I'm quite anxious to look at the northern campaign too. I'm supposing you could probably put the two games together. But if you do, I do know it's going to take a lot of room because this board here is quite big and it takes a good portion of my table. And I have to put the flyleaf out to get both maps in. And I don't even know if there's any rules for connecting the two. As far as I'm concerned, the Southern Campaign and the War in the North are two different things entirely. But um, perhaps somebody's going to be adventurous enough to put the two together and make one large game out of it. So that's my general look at Tarleton's Quarter. It's now out of print, getting kind of rare. And it is a good game. I highly recommend it as a simulation of the American Revolution. Thank you for watching.